without further ado, I'd like to welcome Andrew. Um, welcome back, actually. Um, we interviewed Andrew, wasn't myself, but uh, back in June 2018, yeah. June last year. Um, so no, two years ago, I think it was. Was it? <coughs> I think so. You'll, you'll be right. I mean, I wasn't there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's been a quick year. <laughs> so. June last year, yes. Sorry, yes. Mm-hmm. It has so. been a quick year. <laughs> Time flies, as they say. Um, so in terms of introduction, I'll try and make it short, but it's really hard given how much Andrew's done. Um, over 25 years of experience, um, a mindfulness and behavioural change expert, over 11 million, I'm probably more now, um, a few more. <coughs> 11 million a bit, maybe 12, so if you round up, yeah, we we'll round up for today, um, app downloads on the App Store and Google Play. Um, so Andrew has helped people to relax, to change, to create the lives they want. Um, he's also helped them to overcome stress, um, anxiety, and break bad habits. Um, also to reach their full potential. So, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so he specialises in stress management, relaxation techniques, uh, hypnotherapy, yep. um, and meditation and mindfulness. So, where to begin? I'm not really sure, um, but I guess maybe going back to back to the very beginning, yep. um, if that's okay. Um, so, for anybody who is maybe not as familiar, how would you describe what you do um, in general? Uh, right. Well, that's. A I know a bit of a, a longer question. That to is start. a difficult one because what I did ten years ago is now different to what I do mm. now. Um, I started. Uh, I was introduced to meditation at school. Uh, there was a programme on television called Kung Fu. Most of you guys are probably way too young <laughs> to remember it. David Carradine. But everyone at that stage was going about karate chopping everyone else. And Like many kids at that time, I went along to karate classes and uh, our martial arts classes. And uh, I was lucky enough that at that class, the last five or ten minutes, the, 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 the chap who was teaching us did meditation. And as I sat there and listened to my friends and colleagues and mm. schoolmates giggling, I thought, wait a minute, there's something to this. And that led on to a sort of lifetime journey of looking at how the mind affects how we are, um, both externally and internally. Um, but it took me, it took me uh, 17, 18 years to find out that I could do it as a career. So 1994, after a sort of little dark night of the soul and uh, some personal issues, uh, I uh, I discovered that I could train as a clinical and medical hypnotherapist, and I did that from ninety four into ninety five, and started working in that at that at that stage, mm. and that was a transformation for me. <coughs> Previous to that, I had always been really envious of people who had found a career something that they wanted to do, something that they loved and they were driven to do it. Um, so I realised how fortunate I was mm. to discover that at that at that age. Absolutely. Um, I'm looking back now if you had the opportunity to share any lessons you've learned since mm-hmm. you started. Would there be anything in particular that you'd share with yourself from, uh, from the journey so far? Uh, if I could go back and talk to myself then... Mm. Um, I don't know actually I think you just there are certain things in life that you just know are so good that you just do it Mm. and it just feels good so when I started I was training at Caledonian University in Glasgow and I there was 60 there was a company called London College of Clinical Hypnotherapy there was 66 Mm. people there and of the 66 people uh, some of them dropped off after the the foundational course, and I think there were 40 left for the diploma, which was another 12 months. Mm-hmm. And out of those 40, only three started working as hypnotherapists, which I found was wow. incredible. Mm. But halfway through the diploma course, I had already quit my job and given my current company car back and told them what they could do with their pension and whatever it was. <laughs> actually, it was a family business, so I was probably quite polite, but I, uh, I was starting to see clients. And it was just, mm. it wasn't, it, I wasn't, it, it was just a, 
it was just a push from behind. It was just something that I couldn't control. I just needed mm. to do it. And it was nothing to do with money and it was nothing to do with anything else apart from a drive to do it. I had found what made my soul sing, mm. which is a blessing. Mm. Fantastic. And, and how important do you think, you know, having that drive, that kind of, I guess, intrinsic meaning for starting a business or a career, how important do you think that is? Well, I think that's why most folk find startups so exciting because mm. they're, they're, it's, it's just filling every cell in your body. You're just, you're just wanting to drive yourself forward with it. And if it's something you love and it's also helping people and you can see that it's going to help change even just one person's life, that's, that can be mm. magical. Absolutely. And if you had any advice for you know, hard-working entrepreneurs and people who are you know, 24 7 and then yeah. are maybe resistant to start um, working into mindfulness and, and relaxation. Um, okay, well, my bit of advice would be if you, if you think of all the great creative leaps, if you read anything about Beethoven or Einstein or Henry Ford or mm. Elon Musk even, or, mm. or I watched a documentary on uh, last night or the night before on Bill Gates on Netflix, which was really fascinating. And all their great leaps forward have come not in the boardroom and not in, mm. not in brainstorming sessions, but in the shower or while they're reading or while they're just walking or while they're just relaxing in one form or when just before they go to sleep or just before they wake up. Um, which are sort of classic creativity states. They're called the hypnopompic and the hypnagogic stage where you're not in that full awake stage, but your creativity is unleashed um, I, and it's, it's, a, it's absolute concrete fact that when you start to take time for yourself and you start to loosen off and start to relax and distract yourself from the issues that are going on and you give questions to the computer the answers will come up mm -hmm. and it's one of the reasons in many cases in brainstorming sessions that in creativity sessions that it's if you can't if you can't introduce relaxation or mindfulness, which is difficult at times, because it seems as if you're doing nothing, the next best thing to that is introduce ridiculous laughter, <laughs> and go into the go into the brainstorming and think of the most ludicrous things you can do. Then people start to relax, and when they relax, they access the computer, and then. So, when I've been brought in to do sort of creativity sessions and relaxation. Mm -hmm it's nice to introduce a lot of humour and then mm. people really start to relax and then the ridiculous ideas get brought out, laughed at, put to one side and then some really beautiful ones start to come up. You can't really force creativity. I guess mm. I, I think everyone knows that. You can't force it, you've got to allow it to happen and it's, it's these times of relaxation or, or uh, um, getting immersed in something else that, that un you know, unleash the creativity. Mm, absolutely. And, um, and obviously we've seen much more of a shift now towards looking at a mental well-being, which yes, is really a positive. Huge shift. Um, <clears throat> where do you see that going in maybe the next five years or next ten years potentially? I think it's shifted. Uh, th my business has been transformed. Uh, I, uh, the best bit of advice I got when I started in my particular business was go to work for a charity and do some... Um, uh, do some volunteer work. And uh, one of my lecturers at Caledon Univer University said to me, I asked him what he did, what was the best advice he got, and he said, go and work for a charity. Go and work for a charity to, with, with, with people going through some real issues. Mm -hmm. And coincidentally, <coughs> uh, I was living in Ayrshire at that point, and I, I, you know, a couple of weeks later, I saw a, a poster for Ayrshire Cancer Support, and I was, I was almost all the way through my diploma and uh, I went and, and introduced myself and they jumped at the chance and I went in and I worked one day a week for maybe two or three years with people going through um, the transition that cancer brings. And mm. um, that taught me more than... I mean, I learned more probably in the first two months there than I ever did in my diploma because instead of, as a hypnotherapist, you start off you start off working with smokers, so and most smokers mm. are very similar. It has to be <laughs> said. There's, there's very, there's very few surprises with smokers. But you're, you're, you're advised to do that because smokers are your, ad, your, your adverts. Mm. Smokers will go and talk about it. Smokers love. The smokers will stand in the bar, and someone else will say, 
well, you're not smoking, Jimmy, and they'll say, no, I stopped. I stopped mm. with this guy, Andrew, and, and they'll, they'll quite happily talk about it. Mm. Someone that came to me for bedwetting wouldn't really necessarily stand in the pub and talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you tend to target smokers initially. Uh, and that's great, and that's lovely, and it gets your name known, and other people start coming to see you. But, but working at the ca- doing volunteer work at the Cancer Support Centre, you get people mm. coming in and really opening up. And then you go, shit, this is tough. Mm. What, what do I do here? Yeah. And then you've got the option of... Uh, I personally had the option of working on a week-by-week basis with them and seeing hopefully some form of transformation. Mm. But it also, it also taught me really valuable things. Like, um, you, you, you know, you would expect someone who's dealing with the, the process of cancer, if it's a process, that may be the wrong word, but, and they come in and, and you say, you know, you know, what is it you'd like to work on? Expecting <coughs> some deep, deep issue. And, and, and I remember the first person I worked with um, said, I'm wearing a wig, I've lost my hair. And I'm, that, I want to deal with the embarrassment of this. And you go, oh. Yeah. Right, something completely new. That's mm. where the learning came in. So throwing yourself into something that's a bit left field is important. Fantastic. Would that be the kind of general advice you give for somebody maybe at university who's not really sure about what, what they want to do? Or? Yeah, it's, it's kind of difficult. I mean, I, there, have been, there were times in my early career as a hypnotherapist and then in distress management and meditation, I often thought, I wish I'd started this 20 years young, uh, earlier. Or fifteen years earlier. Come in. Okay. It's okay. Sorry. Um, and I thought, gosh, I wish I'd started this twenty years earlier. And then I realised after I thought, after I thought that, I thought, if I'd done that twenty years earlier, I couldn't possibly have had the experience to be the therapist that I am. Mm. because I had life experience and all the stuff that I thought wasn't valuable at the time I was just cleaning floors or stacking shelves or, or, or working in ground crew for an airline or, but I was I, I, I had about five or six years self-employed before I did hypnotherapy I knew I always wanted to be self-employed I, I just made an arse of it <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I guess speaking of Making a hustle of things. Um, <laughs> um, I guess failures or, or mishaps in general. Have there been any moments that initially have been, you know, something that's not worked or something that's not gone as well that actually has turned out to be a you know, massive learning experience or turned out to give you a, an opportunity that would not have, have popped up? Yeah, yeah. Every hypnotherapist, well, most hypnotherapists give a recording to their clients as a sort of backup, a, a, a belt and braces approach. And um, I started off in cassette, believe it or not, and then went into CDs. When CD drives came out, CD burners, I was burning CDs. And then I thought, well, I could record something here. Mm. And I went into the recording studio and I recorded a, a, a professional rather than just doing it into the, the computer. Into a, I recorded a professional CD and then um, a couple of years went by and I, I had a, I, there was one of my smoking CDs was mentioned in a, a magazine called That's Life mm. it's, a, it's the Jeremy Kyle of magazines <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's absolutely awful <laughs> awful but I sold 600 CDs from that advert from that story wow. and I was burning them myself no. Yeah, I, I think I went through two CD burners, <laughs> and um, and this is before PayPal, I think, and this is before I, it was a free phone number and it was checks that were coming in. It was mad, <laughs> mental, mm. and I was posting these and and it was just mad. It <clears> might have been more than six hundred CDs, but I made a lot of money and I thought I know, I'm going to invest in getting CDs professionally made. And at that point, to get them duplicated, you had to do them in a thousand. So I ordered four thousand CDs. Mm. Stop smoking, deep sleep, and something else in confidence. The four big ones, and I thought I can start selling these on the website. And then the day that I think the day they were delivered, Steve Jobs announced the iPod, mm. and I thought, oh, for f- oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that taught me to watch out for changes in technology of audio mm. delivery. 
that's why I was so keen because I went on to MP3s after that and started selling MP3s through my side. And then when Steve Jobs announced the iPhone, <laughs> I thought, this is interesting. And then when he announced the App Store, I was mm. almost going off like a firework, thinking I could sell maybe a couple of dozen apps through the, mm. through the App Store. So I was, I, I get, my fingers burnt on cassettes <laughs> and to a degree CDs and mm. then getting into the digital market with MP3s was a revelation because you don't have stock which is great so I started mm. recording a ton of content for the MP3s Fantastic and kind of takes us up to a similar time now yep. um, and with the and yeah with technology changing you know, it seems like every couple of months now yeah. how has that been the last few years especially you know with new New app updates, you know, new obviously new iPhones and new new bits of software. Um, has that for been us? More it's been it, for us. It's been a bit of a journey. Um, mm. I've got a business partner in Seattle, and he does the coding and the licensing, and I do the content. Mm. Um, there's big changes coming in the next month, which is sort of causing a little bit of I shouldn't say sleepless nights for me, but a bit of excitement. Mm. Um, so every app update, things can go twang. Yeah. and then we need to polish them um, but our apps are relatively simple they're, they're basically audio playback um, with some tweaks so we've been really lucky the big difference has been the massive uptake in mindfulness and meditation in the app store with some of the big players coming in like Headspace and mm. Calm and <coughs> uh, Simple Habit and uh, Insight Timer mm. and they've come in with really deep pockets whereas we never had we never, we've had relatively decent success in the app store, but we've never done any marketing, and that might be the biggest mistake I've ever made. Mm. Yeah, wow. That's good but we started off with no agenda; we were just playing at it. Mm. So I was the first person to do a meditation app, I think, in the world, mm. if you call it a meditation app, even though it was basic relaxation. But you could call it meditation. So I was the first person to do one, Mike and I, and we. I thought it was going to be like MP3s. I thought it was going to, you know, make enough money for a, a nice meal at the end of the week, or a nice meal at the end of the month. <laughs> and then we released more, and then it just went off stratospheric, mm. and it, it was incredible. So we were, our our relative success has been because, the recordings are good and the coding initially was good. But we were early, and early adopters. Mm. I can't. I can't discount that. That's been a huge advantage. Mm. <coughs> As we, because one of the things he's talked about is timing. You know, being critical with yeah. entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, and one thing I was really, really keen to ask was, you know, having competitors, you know, like Headspace and Mind, with like you said, so many resources, so much money behind it. Yeah. Um. Obviously, it's been a challenge within itself. Um. Yep. Well, yeah, we were approached um, maybe five years ago, four years ago, by some VCs in California, and they went and spoke to Mike. Mike's a tech lawyer, a very clever man, and uh, um, uh, we decided not to go down that route. They were wanting too much of a chunk, but it also meant for Mike he would lose his coding side of the business, and for me, I would, I thought, rightly or wrongly, I thought I'd lose creative control. Mm. Because what we do is relatively different from Headspace and um, Cam, etc. We are mm. a little deeper and a little wider. We're more therapeutic. Mm. Um, but plans are afoot to take them on. From <laughs> 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 <In> Edinburgh. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, and one thing that was also really keen to ask was your thoughts on keeping existing customers happy, yep. but also attracting new customers. Yep. And are there any challenges with that balance of retention and acquisition? Well, it's difficult in the App Store. With MP3s, I've got a contact point with um, email addresses. Mm. I always, as a therapist, I'm always very, very aware of conf client confidentiality, and I've always been really happy to say that that has been a bedrock for my business. Um, when I came into the apps, we built a, a point in that they could contact us on social media or mm. um, join a newsletter, but we never really pushed it. Mm. So we built a relatively decent 
social media following and a relatively decent mailing list. Mm. But I was always aware that people were putting up their hand at that point and saying, I'm using something to help with my mental health. Mm. Things have changed drastically lately. Headspace really ploughed the ground for this. They really opened up the the the, the whole uh, arena for folks saying, I use this. And it's what changed that's been. So mm. when I was doing corporate work 15 years ago, there was no way on earth I could have mentioned hypnotherapy and no way on earth I would have mentioned meditation or mindfulness. Not a, not a chance. Mm. Now, once you get to know people, you can perhaps, you can perhaps broach that subject. Mm. Once the barrier has been broken, but now it's almost expected that if you're doing corporate work, you're talking about meditation or mindfulness or mental health or mental well-being or wellness, mm. um, and you've got to go in with that. So uh, my business that way has changed radically. I've, I don't think I've ever seen such a shift, mm. and it's it's progressing really quickly as more and more people are talking about it. Um, it's been a big and important shift, and especially nowadays. Um, one of the things that affects us all is change. Change financially, physically, mm. geographically, politically, for f- goodness sake. Mm. <laughs> and we're living in a world these days that I don't know, you guys agree, but things are changing radically and quicker and quicker and quicker. And mm. there's an awful lot of people <coughs> struggling at the moment mm. because mm. things are just not the way they should be. Mm. There's this, this general, oh shit, what's happening? What is going on here? Mm. And a lot of people are looking for answers, are looking for solutions, and that's a difficult thing when it's external to you. All you can do is control how you are mm-hmm. internally. So that's there's been a big uptake in these sort of mm. apps. Absolutely. And, and these are the problems. <laughs> Even though my business is built on the, the, the mm. internet and technology is causing as much problems as it is mm. solutions. And, and again, that's something I was going to ask. Um, obviously, I'm the business that's you know, on social media. And yeah. How have you found that balance uh, for yourself? Um, your own kind of I've struggled <coughs> with it. I really have. It's, it's been difficult. And especially in the last, from a business point of view, in the last two, three years, when I've had very little to broadcast from a business point of view, I find myself repeating myself too much. And then I find myself getting caught up in the old social media envy. Mm. I mean, I went, I went away just to take a break. I went to Greece about four weeks ago, mm. back to a favourite place of mine, and I was sitting on the beach in the sunshine in this beautiful place with the waves lapping at 7 o'clock in the morning doing some meditation. And then I looked at Instagram and I thought, look at these lucky bastards. <laughs> and I thought I had to stop myself and go, this is madness. This is absolute madness that I'm looking at people and feeling envious. Mm. This is madness. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not, but I'm the kind of type of person that doesn't then take photos of look where I am and show that because I don't. That's not, that's mm. not what I do. Occasionally, but not much. <laughs> Occasionally, the healthier man. If I met Elon Musk, there'd be photos everywhere. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> or Oprah. Anyone know Oprah? Oh, no, <laughs> no, no, not yet. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Um, and and yeah, I think some of them. I was really interested to ask as well was the idea of momentum, I guess as um that's the right word for it. As a sector, is that the right word? I guess mindfulness as a as a movement, um yes. even from a business sense, because it's changed you know, it's going so so quickly. Yes. But I guess like you said, you know, stress and poor mental health, it seems to be yeah. increasing. Yeah. Um so where where do you see yourself, you know, with the business? shifting with that trend well, there's, there's been a bit of a backlash lately in the last year or two about mindfulness because it has taken on too much of a weight in my opinion mm. so I've got a personal theory about mindfulness and this you can take this on board or not but there are certain there are certain techniques that help people get into a relaxed internal state where they're connected to their computer um, the relaxation stress management um, meditation self hypnosis mindfulness and each one of these things has its own agenda has its own baggage in my mm. opinion so relaxation it seems quite pampering and stress management it seems quite clinical a lot of people in the corporate world don't want to say that their staff are stressed so they don't want to bring in stress management consultants and in my opinion a lot of stress management consultants will come into a business 
and with the best intentions change the working practices and that in itself change causes more stress mm. which really you know they're actually doing it with great intention but it's not working <coughs> meditation is seen as quite a spiritual practice and hypnosis self-hypnosis completely wrongly was seen can be seen with hypnotherapy as a controlling thing and it's not it can't be it never could be. If I could make people lose weight, I'd be a billionaire <laughs> 20 times over. You can help people do what they want to do, but you can't make them do anything. So all these things have an agenda, have a baggage, but mindfulness has never really come with any baggage. It's never really had baggage. So it was quite accepted and researched. And as soon as some of the universities researched it, <coughs> and uh, bloody hell, here we go, this, this stuff works. We've researched it and it works. As soon as it got some research in universities behind it, it took off, as it should have, because mm. it's magnificent. But it's not the be-all and end-all, and to put your boat and call your boat mindfulness, you're, you're, you're neglecting some of the most powerful and incredible other techniques that there are out there, mm. like post-hypnotic suggestion and neuro-linguistic programming and... Um, and a ton of other stuff that really are effective for helping people change. Mm. It's, yeah, it's so I think there's, there's maybe going to be a little shift away from yeah. mindfulness, but mm. maybe not, because it is a, it is a, it's a great thing to do. It's an amazing mm. thing to do. But it, you can see it with, I mean, good God, Headspace are making a ton of money and they're massive, but I look at that and I, I watch them saying things like Headspace for sleep, and I go, well, uh, mindfulness for sleep, and I think, well, that's good, but there are there are much better techniques for that. Mm. And if you're client centred, you should be using the best technique for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and if somebody was, you know, keen to really start working after their, you know, well being. <coughs> yeah. Where would they start? Because obviously there's different, like you mentioned, different categories like mindfulness and. Well, my first the first port of call for me is always just learning relaxation skills. There are, there are certain simplistic techniques that you can learn to retrain your body into relaxation. They are very simple, and the problem with them is that they seem so simple that people think, how can that work? It's so simplistic. There's mm. nothing to it. But once you've learned them and you've integrated them and you practice with them and you allow it to happen, it becomes, you, you, it's no longer a technique, you just become someone who can relax, mm. if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So once you have that grounding and relaxation, then meditation or mindfulness or goal setting or affirmations or intention setting, manifestation, anything of creative visualization, anything that you want to do with the mind becomes so much easier. Mm. But a lot of people go into the meditation world and think, I know that I should do meditation, and then they go into some form of group, and they open the door, and everyone's round in a circle holding hands chanting, and they go, okay, not for me. That's too much to start with. <clears throat> a lot of people I've worked with, and we do relaxation, then I introduce them to real basic re meditation. Might end up in a circle holding hands and chanting, but that's their decision once they've been through that process. Mm. I do it myself, it's lovely. I'll go and <laughs> hug a tree, I'm happy with that. <laughs> But you, 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 can't, you can't get into meditation quickly. You've got to do it in a very gentle way. Mm. And it's one of the most difficult things to teach. There's a thing in life called the law of reverse effect. And the law of reverse effect states that anything that should happen naturally, if you try to do it, it doesn't work. In fact, the opposite happens. So most folk recognise this with sleep. If you try to fall asleep, you end up more awake. And, and that's exactly the same for creativity and memory and intuition and sleep and, and uh, relaxation. So many people wait until something's broken mm. and then they try to meditate or they try to relax or they try to do this. And because they're trying to do it and they're desperate to do it, they end up with the opposite effect. Mm. So, there are, there are, so we're taught most things in life were really... We really, sh you know, we really struggle to learn. Learning to walk and talk and ride a car and, and ride a bike and drive a car and use a computer and, and do all these things take conscious effort and determination and motivation and focus and re repetition. And, and then people try to use that same learning mechanism for the things that it doesn't work for. So they try to make mm. themselves sleep with logic and they, get, they end up more awake. Mm. 
And so the secret, and I believe the secret of anything to do with creativity and relaxation meditation is just to find simple techniques that, that suit you and a voice that suits you and then not give a damn about it and not giving a damn about it means it sinks in and your body releases and then you start to integrate it it's a tough lesson to learn for a lot of folk absolutely and I think um, have you found it's something that I've tried to tune into especially nowadays people are Becoming increasingly obsessed is the wrong word, but they're looking for quick wins, and you know. Yes. Have you found that's been quite a consistent shift? Yes. With people, and that's. Yes, mm. I don't have time to relax. Yeah. Mm. Make me relax quicker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, there's our best-selling, <laughs> our best-selling <clears throat> single subject app, and it was best-selling in CD and MP3 and app is deep sleep. And that's because, unlike many other things, you either sleep or you don't. So people use it and they sleep, or they don't. Most people do. And it is my opinion that it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, physically or emotionally or spiritually or energetically or financially. It doesn't matter how bad things in you are in your life. If you have a good night's sleep, things are better. <coughs> so that's the first port of call. Mm. Learn to relax, learn to sleep. <coughs> and both go hand in hand. And if you can learn to sleep... My problem is that I get too excited about things and then I can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot going on with my business at the moment. So um, if, if you would like me to... I was going to say, it's, it's a very really good... Um, it's like you read my mind. Are yeah, you I mind reading as well? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so after 10 years of being in the business with Mike, uh, my business partner, I'm, I'm taking over the entire app business. So I have... In the words of the Godfather, I've made him an offer he can't refuse. So he's at the time he needs to pull out of it, and I'm at the time where I'm jumping up and down, needing control over it. Mm. So I think we were talking earlier, Glenn, about um, you know I now after 25 years now realise that I'm only now beginning a startup <laughs> mm. and thinking, shit, I don't know what I'm going to do here because I'm going to need devs and people much cleverer than I to delve into the mechanisms of these apps and see what's working and what's not and what needs patched and if they're worth patching and what's worth doing and what's worth building and, but it's a very exciting time so right now during <coughs> September I'm in the process of taking control and ownership of all these apps we've got 24 on iOS and we've got 15 or 16 on Android some of which are broken and need fixed quite quickly <laughs> uh, and uh, it was uh, I can tell you, I can tell you that when iOS, whatever the new iOS came out, I was like, oh my God, here we go. Something might just go twang in all these apps because it's, it's a substantial chunk of my income, these apps. Mm. Um, so I am now at the stage where in the next week to two weeks, I'll have control of all of them. Mm. And at that point, I'll let loose a friendly developer to... <laughs> dig into the coding and see what it comes up with. I hope it's good news. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. And, and is that something you can see maybe the next couple of years, very, very long term projects? Yes, they need to be they need to be protected from iOS and Android updates. Um and we need to because we've got a ton of installed apps, so we need to make the best of that. Mm. So my Initial thought is that we use them as a springboard to build the one app to rule them all. <laughs> the Scottish version. Heat space, I'm calling <laughs> <laughs> Calm oh. your bastard. No, maybe not. <laughs> um, but something like that. I haven't thought, I haven't thought of the idea. That's, that's my first beer. Um, but uh, there is something there, but I'm mm. not clever enough. I know the content and I can record and I've got a thousand things I can record. I've got a list mm. as long as my arm, but there, is, there, there are cleverer <coughs> people that I need to meet in the next three to six months mm. that will say, this is where the industry is going, this is where you are, and this is where we think you should go. Mm. And that's exciting. That's, that's really awesome. exciting. I'll tell you what, if, if Headspace was... So the app's I'd be uh, <laughs> to this way. Maybe in Glasgow, but maybe in <laughs> Glasgow. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, so we've got a bit more time for a few questions. Sure. Um, 
Before we do that, are there any even really, really simple techniques that we can go home and, and potentially try sure. today? Sure. Um, one that, you know, the very beginners like myself can uh, hopefully not mess up too much. And Sure. Would anyone like to do a wee five minutes? Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So the, the secret of any relaxation or meditation or mindfulness is not to try. That's number one. Number two, this is not about control. Number three, in 25 years, I've never had anyone fall asleep. It might happen, but it never has. Uh, but your mind can wander off, and that's fine. But we're only going to do a little short technique. Um, yeah, maybe five five to ten minutes, something like that. Everyone's Sounds good, good with that. I'm off of that. All right. Okay, so if you want to sit with your feet on the floor, put your hands in your lap, separate them. Okay, this is... Um, this is a technique that I've been using for about three or four years. It's not mine. This is from Eckhart Tolle, and, um, or Tolle, depending on which way you pronounce his name, author of The Power of Now. Um, I use a di slightly different technique, but uh, this is one that's been quite transformational for me about quietening the funky mind. Okay, so. Okay, take a nice gentle deep breath in and out, and close your eyes. Okay, good. Now, because you're sitting with your eyes closed, there's no way that you can see where your right hand is. And because you're not moving, there's not really the sensations of any movement in your right hand. So how do you know you still have a right hand? Well, there are a few ways to notice it. Firstly, there's the weight. Simply by resting your awareness on the weight of your right hand, you start to notice it. And by noticing it, you might notice that the weight of your right hand changes. And secondly, there's the temperature. Now there's two sensations of temperature for many people. There's the temperature of the connection of your palm and your fingers to your lap. And then there's perhaps the movement of air across the top of your hand. Maybe not so much in a sealed room. The temperature, the weight of your right hand. But there's a third sensation that slowly starts to appear as you rest more and more awareness there. And that third sensation is the aliveness, the energy, some form of internal energy within the hand. Now everyone feels it slightly different when they start, but it's there. Just noticing how it feels, the weight, the temperature, the energy, the aliveness in the hand. Now what's interesting is that you can notice those three sensations there in your right hand and holding it there you can start to feel the same sensations in your left hand. Slowly at first, but perhaps a little easier this time. The weight, the temperature, the aliveness. It may seem like a movement, it may seem like a tingling. But there's one thing for sure. The only thing that you can do wrong is try too hard. And so doing it right is just about noticing. Nothing more than that. Not trying, just noticing. Left hand, right hand. Now what's even more interesting is that you can hold your awareness there in both hands. 
and you can start to feel the same sensations in your feet. Right foot, left foot, weight, temperature, energy. And maybe in the feet there's a fourth. Maybe the sensations of the compression of your feet within the shoes. Right hand, left hand, right foot, left foot. Just noticing. And because we're doing a little short version of this today, we'll just move on a little quicker. Perhaps you can notice the weight of your body, your entire body now in the chair, and the temperature within the body. And maybe, just maybe, feel the aliveness in the body. Your body really loves <coughs> this attention. You're nourishing it with your awareness. And even in this short period of time, you may notice only when I mention it that your breathing has become a little slower. Your heart rate has slowed just a little. And the conscious mind, what the Buddhists call the monkey mind, which can be our greatest friend and our worst enemy, is quieting down just a little. And so, as we near the end of this, and so that we come back to full eyes open conscious awareness together, in a minute, or a few seconds rather, I'll count up from one to ten. As I count up, just bring yourself back into the room, into the present moment into normal weight and energy and sensations. <coughs> at eight, take a deep awakening breath in and out, and at 10, you can open your eyes and have a gentle stretch. So at eight, a deep awakening breath, and at 10, eyes open and a gentle stretch. So coming back now. One, two, three, coming back up. Four, five, waking up. Six, seven, eight, a deep waking breath, in and out. Nine, ten, and just open your eyes and just taking care not to punch the person next to you. Have a nice, gentle stretch. So, did anyone find that hard? It's good. Up we do it again. <laughs> okay. Wow. So that can be quite unusual if you've never done anything like that before. But this here, this conscious mind that worries and continually goes round in cycles, mm. is continually either thinking about the past or the future, and is very seldom, rarely in the present right now. Mm. Doesn't take much to distract itself. It really doesn't. It's a bit Homer Simpson-ish. You can just <laughs> have a little squirrel. There we go. Um, but one of the most beautiful things about that technique, that inhabiting the body with the energy, is that the more you do that, the more that this mind, the mind is diluted within the body. And the body, as I say, I know it's a strange thing to say, but the body loves that technique. It absolutely loves it. It's, you start to get so much in touch. And... So what happens is that that technique, very much like progressive relaxation or any other techniques that I teach, is, is a template that you follow and you allow it to happen and you're not, you don't get angry with yourself if you can't do it or you get stuck, you just do it. And you follow it and you do it, you do it, you do it, you do it. And after about two or three weeks of doing that, the technique has disappeared and you're just able to close your eyes and do it like riding a bike or driving a car. It has you have become unconsciously confident in doing it. Three weeks, that's all it takes. To be able to sit down 
and feel the energy within the body and the mind quietens. And then you can follow that up with diaphragmatic breathing, taking your breathing down into the belly and following that. And then you connect that with a countdown technique, counting down in your mind from 10 to 1, but counting down as you breathe out. If you've got kids, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. Don't bother counting sheep. Uh, just get them to count down from 20 to 1, imagining sheep jumping over. And you count down as the sheep jump over in their mind as they breathe out and they'll be asleep within. They'll be asleep before it gets to two or three, I would imagine, for most times. Beautifully simple. Beautifully, beautifully simple. But the, the technique falls away and all it becomes is a, you being able to do it. And there are people who can do this. There are people who relax. My father does it. Sits down and, <coughs> and he's away. <laughs> Maybe that's not relaxing, that's sleeping. Maybe that's the whiskey. But that's my point is... <laughs> My point is that there are people who do it naturally. Most of us have forgotten how to do it because we're here all the time. All the time. Mm. Um, yeah, so there we go. Fantastic. Uh, what about you guys? I'm feeling like a new man, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can find you one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, so always keen to have you guys, uh, well, give you guys the opportunity, ask any questions. Um, anybody keen to... Can I kick us off? Nick? Nick. Hi Andrew, so you know I'm a big fan of your work and you personally. Cuckoo App is a new venture based in Scotland. Yes. Scotland licensed. But are you doing any other kind of stuff? I feel like this could be taken to businesses, <coughs> corporates, looking at overwhelm, stress, imposter syndrome, all the things that are such hot topics in our community and the wider business sense. So what have you thought about that? Well, Cuckoo was a startup that I started in, not so much in frustration at not being in control of the apps, but I wanted, and, and, and Cuckoo was a, a, an app that I'd started myself to enable people who have audio content to deliver it within an app, without building their own app. Things have changed ever so slightly because things are changing with I, the new iOS, and that <coughs> always happens, but um, I have seen... I've got a ton of content on MP3s and I've seen my sales of MP3s drop by 80% in six years. Simply because it's very difficult to get MP3s onto a mobile device without jiggery-pokery with Dropbox or anything like that or into a laptop. And, and now that iTunes has disappeared, it's becoming even more difficult. Um, and I know there's a great deal of meditation teachers and hypnotherapists out there with a ton of great content. And because they never get into the app store, like I was very lucky to do that, but they're, they're really suffering with sales. So I built Cuckoo in order to do that, and it took me about six months to do it with the help of Scottish Enterprise, etc., etc. And I built, and then the day we launched it, my business partner Mike said that I could, we could negotiate me taking the apps back, which was a complete surprise to me. Um, and uh, so I obviously quite rightly for my own mental health. I'll just hibernate Cuckoo at the moment, concentrate on what's bringing in the money. So Cuckoo's um, in hibernation, but will be resurrected very soon. Um, on the other note, there are plenty of people out there doing corporate stuff, and it's, it's a wide open market at the moment and much needed. I personally do a bit of com corporate work, but I need to concentrate on the digital side of things. Um, I did a lot of corporate work earlier on in my career, and uh, I just get a little bit jaded with the travelling, with it. Um, doing a one-day course turned into three days because of travelling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, I'm all, I always will do corporate work, but I'm not chasing it at the moment. But it's certainly a huge market, huge, and 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 there needs to be more and more people doing it, and there needs to be more and more people doing this on a voluntary basis. In schools, so there's a lot of people. One of my colleagues, uh, uh, Gary from the Mindful Enterprise, who you may or may not know, but he's doing, he's created this whole social enterprise about doing mindfulness training in corporates and then putting back some of the profits into that into teaching in schools. It's a great thing. So there's more and more people doing that. Yeah, but it's much needed. Is that a social enterprise, the Mindful Enterprise? I think so. Hmm. To contact them. Yes. Hi. Hi. 
Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on, like, it's great that corporates who you know are taking time out to spend days in mentalists, but how do we take that away from being, like, an add-on to being part of the culture um, and not just something that we do when people need it, but actually as preventative from these things happening? Well, you I know, think like stress. Yeah, well, I think that's why the digital side of things has become so important. Uh-huh. Um, it's all very well me going in and teaching people. I do a thing called a stress toolbox. Um, and depending on who I was delivering it to, it might have been a relaxation toolbox or a mindfulness toolbox. It's exactly the same techniques. It's just who you're delivering it to. <coughs> and that's a day's training, but I was always able to give a ton of recordings with that. Now, it doesn't matter who you're teaching. If you, if you, if you teach 20 people, some of them will run with it. And their lives will change. Their well-being will improve. And some people won't forget about it we all do at times what's interesting in a corporate environment is that if you give people techniques that they themselves feel give them a bit of control back over their stress it gives them a language to talk about so if they see someone else feeling a bit agitated or scattered they then have the language to go and say hey why don't you go and do that breathing that strange man told us or (laughs) do you remember that recording he gave us or why don't you go and take five minutes? And instead of saying take five minutes to go and stand outside and stare at the clouds, it's five minutes with a specific technique that they've been taught that they can either remember and try or they can access a recording and do. And that's really powerful when your peers are telling you and your colleagues are telling you and they've got the language to be able to say you should go and do that. It's worked for me. And that's what I feel is transformational when you can teach a big group of people in the same organisation. I have a second question as well. Mm. Um, you were talking about how, you know, um, I can't remember what, what one of the apps it was, but um, have like mindfulness for sleep and things like that. Yes. Do you think that, you know, they're calling it that because so many people, you know, were normalising words such as, oh, I'm so OCD, I'm so, my anxiety's bad, you know, we're normalising words like that. So people think we need mindfulness when <coughs> in reality they, they, they probably don't because they don't actually have these conditions. Perhaps. I think it's become more common to use mm. these words. And I don't know if there's anything wrong with that, but okay. it's, they're, they're grey areas, aren't they? So no one really, you know, mm-hmm. it's really difficult. You know, it's for instance, I, I, you know, people will say to me, I, I, you know, I've got a migraine, and I, I'll say, well, if you had a migraine, you'd be flat on your back in a dark room in severe, severe pain. But there's levels, so, you know... It's, it's a difficult thing to say. I think I think recordings are are useful, but it's even more powerful to learn the techniques yourself. And then you change internally. It becomes a it becomes a pattern. And I teach a technique called diaphragmatic breathing. It's really, really simple. Basic, basic, basic stuff. Shifting your breathing down into the diaphragm, that's all it is. But people who practice it and integrate it will find that if they then, after three or four weeks of just gently practising it, Mm -hmm. when they find themselves in a situation that in the past they would have been stressed, their body and their mind have taken over. It's as if the body goes, I know what to do now. And they've become someone who can cope with it better, rather than it being a technique that they use. And this is one of the big issues with these sort of techniques, because the the impact of them is so general, it's like, you know, how do you measure well-being? And it's something that an awful lot of people, because they learn these techniques and they transition into someone who just copes better, mm-hmm. it also feels natural to them, if that makes sense. Yeah. <coughs> so it's very difficult then going back and looking at research because a lot of people don't realise how, mar- how far they've improved. Sometimes it's other people that will point out, you're looking better, you're doing this. And when other people point it out, they start to recognise, oh, I am sleeping better. And because of that, I've got time in the morning and because of that, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm happier with the kids and I'm giving them a good breakfast and they're happier and they're <coughs> chatting and they go off to school and I've got a bit of time and because there's not been any hassle and we're not shouting at one another they'll go for a walk and it, do you see what it just all rolls into just well-being that's something you've got to look back on and be prodded a bit before you recognise all the changes thank you there we go Andrew uh, wonderful talk this evening I wonder thank if you can just pick your brains on something for those of us a bit older, we were we grew up with the days when you actually paid for a product. Yes. Now there is so much free content out there with people making models on the back of free content. Yes. And advertising. Well, have you any advice or any thoughts on how you can add extra value 
ahead of this free contract that it seems to be everywhere? That's difficult because it's it's a transition that all of us are going through. Um, when I uh, when the app started coming out, I had CDs at twelve ninety nine, and uh, and my MP threes were eight ninety nine, and then the the app started and the pl the prices just plummeted, and we were selling at one dollar ninety nine, <coughs> and I thought for probably two or three months this is this is a nightmare, an absolute nightmare, and yet <coughs> we sold hundreds of thousands, and they were much more lucrative. So it depends on the, the audience you're going to. There's, there's apps out there who, who get their entire business is advertising funded. But the app ecosystem is not the way it, it was in the early days. There's now five, seven, five million apps. So a lot of people are doing, are offering free to sort of, to generate some form of mailing list to get some traction. But I think you've still got to have a USP and you've got to have a good product because it doesn't. But that's a difficult one because <coughs> there's a lot of people in my business who, who get into doing the, the kind of stuff that I do because they feel as if they should be helping people, which is great. But because they feel they should be helping people, they don't put a value on it. So they give everything away for free. And then that becomes really difficult because you've got to eat. And then I can't remember what book it was in, but it was <coughs> transformational for me. I can't remember, maybe eight or nine years ago when it, there was a sentence in it that said, how can you expect anything? Any, how can you expect anyone to put value on something that you yourself have put no value on? And I thought, Jesus, that's transformational. You've got you to gotta have value in it. But it's a really difficult one. It's a really difficult one. Um, We've got two free apps, one called Relax Light and one called Power Nap. Um, Relax Light's about 13 minutes. Power Nap does what it says in the tin and it's about 35 minutes long. And my God, I'd wish I'd, I wish I'd made that a paid app. Because <laughs> folk love that. But then the free app, because it's, you know, had hundreds of thousand downloads, maybe that leads into people paying for something. I'm just curious, you mentioned how many apps that you have now? I've got 24 on iOS. Okay, so see someone who perhaps would be under the category of I'm too busy for this, I don't have time to relax, etc, etc. How would they know, I mean, how would they know to, to choose one? What one's going to maximise, you know, their, their experience? How would I know, for example, out of those 24, wh which one to go for if I just consider myself overworked? <coughs> or okay, so a lot of them are very general, and but a lot of them are quite specific, even though they're general. So, things like um, quit smoking, you wouldn't use unless you were obviously oh, stop smoking. Um, um, so procrastination. Like no, more. no, because I'd be doing the same recording every time. Yeah. Um, there's, there's ones just called relax de or de-stress. And the beauty of them is, you know, they're two ninety nine. So folk will say to me, I bought one of your apps yesterday. And I say, well, 50 pence. <laughs> 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 um, so, but they're ones, if you look at the list, you'll see yeah. it will jump out at you. It will jump out at you. Yeah. How do we find them? Find just put my name into the... They're all in your name. Okay. They're all in my name. It's something, something with, and then me. Mm -hmm. Which was a good decision at the start. I hated it. I hated it. I didn't want my name on them, but Mike was very clever with it. He thought if you put in positivity and these become popular and everyone starts copying them, how do you distinguish yourself? Because we didn't have an individual brand. We'd released single subject apps until Apple told us to stop. <laughs> Apple said, you, don't, you can't do any more of these. These should, you, no, that's too many. That's just enough. They're too simple. And so we wrote a letter to Apple. Luckily, Mike's a lawyer. And Mike said, if they'd, if they'd tell us no after this one, we don't, we don't bite the hand that feeds us. Mm -hmm. So we then designed one called Relax Plus, which is a library app, which is free, but it has in-app purchases. And that has been our saving grace. However, when we started putting other in-app purchases in that were a bit longer tail, because people were saying, well, we want nail biting, or we want this, or we want that. They weren't the searchable in an in-app, 
situation as they would be as single subject standalone mm. apps. So I had done as many as I could in the sort of more general ones, but then app purchases, we, we couldn't do any more. So uh, now we need to think of a different product. They're all uh, narrated by you. All narrated by me. In Scottish. In Scottish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So a big Thank time. you, Shrek. Someone <laughs> said to me a couple of days ago. <laughs> <laughs> the kid calls you Shrek. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, so I think time just for a very, very quick question. Yeah, I'll be that's very okay. Quick. Yeah. I'll try. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Thanks, was it really interesting and revitalizing? Um, I wonder before I even knew the subject of tonight, I listened to a podcast all about the Headspace guys. Yes. And they said the game changer thing for them was moving to the States to yes. LA. Yes. Where obviously there's just everyone's doing mindfulness and everything. Yeah. I wonder have you ever been uh, tempted to do that, given the big market and um, and with that in mind, how do you put up or not put up with how do you confront and overcome the kind of culture in Scotland of, oh, you'll be fine. You know, that kind of cover up, there's no such thing as mental health, or you're just mental. You know, <laughs> 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 it's basically what Valid, so, point. Yeah. <laughs> Valid point. Um, I'm, um, I've been over to Seattle many times, but um, Headspace, very correctly, based themselves there because they were, they were breaking new ground. And they were doing it in a way that we never had the chance to do because they were doing it with a, a big budget. And they've done it wonderfully. They've done it, and you know, no one can doubt that. Um, we, on the other hand, I think now are at the stage, when I say we, I mean me, are at the stage where it's much more accepted. And I think there's, when you look at the tech scene in Edinburgh particularly, people are proud to be here and proud to be seen based here. And I love that. I absolutely love that. I also recognise that unlike an awful lot of people who are, well, Andy Puddingham, who does Headspace, is English. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm glad that I've got the accent I have. Um, <coughs> and I'm, I'm happy with that. And, but I think, I don't think in the current state I want to go to America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stay in Edinburgh. <laughs> stay in Edinburgh. Uh, and I think if you can't build it here, where, I mean, what the hell, what's the point of being over there? Maybe for investment purposes, that might be a different thing. If that ever happens, but right at this moment, it's here. Yeah, this is an amazing place, and the sort the you just networking in Edinburgh is just extraordinary, and the ability to connect with people who, if it was London, let's say, you'd never be able to connect with. It's just mind blowing, mind blowing. So mm. yeah, yeah. it's great. That's it. Well, such a brilliant point to end on. Um, so first of all, massive thank you for coming down, Andrew. Awesome. Um, especially with everything you got going on. <laughs> so before I forget, because sometimes I almost do forget, just a quick thank you um, for taking your time. So these guys are based out of Edinburgh University. Right. Um, it's called Social Stories Club. Right. So they have gift boxes like this one, um, with socially conscious companies so chocolate made fair trade that kind of thing so fantastic um, was a wee nice touch um, I shall I shall Instagram about that later <laughs> I'll be I'll be envious when I, when the I point of them so. giving me it this is brilliant <laughs> so, fantastic uh, thank you very that's much that's the takeaway and, and yeah just to wrap up guys I want you get kind of back networking as well so thank you for coming down especially on such a um, well Scottish <laughs> September <laughs> evening um yeah, obviously we, we can't do it without you. You know, you guys are what makes Startup Grinds. Um, so yeah, in terms of next month, uh, we've got a special theme. So here's a presentation I prepared earlier. Um, before I forget as, as well, fans again to CMS, absolutely brilliant every single month. Um, I mean, to get a venue like this, you know, yeah, to get a food, a drink, it's absolutely incredible. Um, and I can only say a view of Edinburgh Castle, maybe not <laughs> so much now, but... Um, yeah, once again, absolutely superb, uh, superb sponsors. Um, so that's such a story school. I meant to time that better before, so <laughs> pretend that was perfectly timed. Um, so for next one, quite an exciting one, um, we're teaming up with Heroku for a products and engineering month. Uh, we'll be confirming the speaker very, very soon. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled on the newsletter, social media, and startagrind.com the website so that's it i think um i'll let you guys get back to the pizza if there's any left uh, the beer if there's any left as well 
Um, and yeah, thanks again for coming, guys, and hope we see you next month, end of October. Okay. Thank you.